Tony, can you hear me in the back? Good. Um, before I introduce our esteemed guest and speaker, Mr. Cordello, let me put in a plug uh, for another event next Thursday, the 15th of February at 1215. The Intelligence Studies Project, the Strauss Center, Clement Center, and LBJ are going to bring you an event we're calling a conversation on leadership in the public sector. <coughs> for that lineup, we have the Honorable John Brennan, former DCIA and Special Advisor to the President on Counterterrorism. LBJ's own Julian Castro, former Secretary of HUD and uh, HUD and, and Mayor of San Antonio, uh, the second coolest town in Texas. Our, our Chancellor, the former Commander of U.S. SOCOM, Bill McRaven, and OBJ's own uh, Admiral Bobby Inman. So that's a heck of a lineup, and we hope you'll, you'll join us. Um, so now it's my privilege to introduce our distinguished uh, speaker. Robert Cardillo is the sixth director of the National Geospatial Agency. He assumed that office in October of 2014. Prior to this assignment, he served as the first Deputy Director for Intelligence Integration in the office of the Director of National Intelligence, which is where I first met him, from 2010 to 2014. I'll let him tell you about it, but he briefed the President in that capacity 300 and how many times? 25. 25. In addition, he served as the Deputy Director of the Defense Intelligence Agency and the Deputy Director for Analysis DIA from 2006 to 2010. And in the summer of 2009, Mr. Cardillo served as the acting J-2 uh, in support of the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, which was the first for a civilian. Uh, he began his career with DIA in 1983 as an Im imagery analyst. I got, I got a chance to listen to him tell uh, one of my young undergrads why he joined and how much the phenomenal amount of money they paid him uh, when, he, when he came in, <laughs> which he thought made him rich. I thought the same thing when I came to Washington. Um, he earned a Bachelor of Arts in uh, Government from Cornell in 1983 and a Master of Arts in Mass Security Studies from Georgetown in 88, and he is a recipient of many honors and medals, and I hope you agree with me that we're lucky to have him, and we just want to thank you for coming, Robert. Um, look, uh, thanks Paul, uh, Steve, uh, Admiral, it's a privilege to be here today. Um, I've made this joke a number of times, but I haven't seen all of you. Uh, every day out of Washington is what I call recess, so I'm just thrilled uh, to be here, and, it's, uh, and that would be true no matter where, but especially here. Uh, and uh, I appreciate this invitation and this opportunity. What, uh, the game plan is not all that um, structured, but it roughly uh, should go as follows. Um, I'll expound a little bit on some of the things that Paul just uh, described in a broad measure to let you know who's speaking to you, uh, where I come from, perspectives, experiences that I've had, but uh, I'll do that for um, you know, no more than 30 minutes because what I really would like to do is go sit here um, uh, with Steve, I think, and, uh, and have a conversation with you. Um, and I'm happy to discuss something that I, I touch on or go into deeply or something that I don't that's on your mind and you'd like to discuss. I, I can only imagine that in, in this room, on this campus, with, with this kind of uh, center leadership, that the topics could go far and wide, and I, I look forward to all that. So, so who's standing before you? Um, um, you know, beyond that, that first letter of, um, of acceptance into the U.S. government back in 1983, uh, I grew up as a military brat, father's a class of 55, grad from West Point, and so that meant uh, many moves across the country uh, in Europe. Um, one of those moves was to Fort Hood, Texas for my fifth, sixth, and seventh grades. Uh, so I, I did study Texas government for three years. That's pretty much all I got for three years uh, down in Colleen. Um, uh, but uh, again, fond memories of, of the time here and love coming back. Uh, later um, in my father's career, he was the commander of the 3rd Cav, which at the time was out at Fort Bliss. So I had my time out in very far west Texas uh, as well. So in that sense, it's good to be back. Um, 
as I ex got the question from the students this morning, said, you know, how the heck do you get a job, or how did you get hired into the U.S. intelligence community? And it's a bit of a sad story uh, in the sense that um, because I was applying in the spring, well, I guess the fall of 82 into the spring of 83, uh, we were going through, the country was going through a, a rebuilding of defense. It's what President Reagan ran on. And thus he was rebuilding um, uh, the Defense Department. Well, uh, in case you didn't know, you, there's not a budget line for the Intelligence Department or the Intelligence Funding. Uh, most of it sits within that big number when people say this is what we're spending on defense. And so when there's a rise in the Defense Department, you can imagine most times that means they're increasing the intelligence capability necessary to support the increased military capability in defense. That's not always true in most cases. So, my application went into the metal box, you know, at the right time. Um, and yeah, I thought I had a decent degree and decent grades and I, you know, could stand up straight, uh, etc. But I didn't bring a huge value proposition. <coughs> and what I had to tell the students this morning was, well, I think my application might be accepted today. I don't think I would get an interview. Because I don't have the additional attributes that we're looking for today. Uh, I'm very pleased to say that roughly um, I have the privilege of leading almost 10,000 uh, professionals in this geospatial intelligence business. Uh, and every year we bring in uh, eight to 900 new teammates. Uh, we, have a, we have a very strong intern program, very proud of it. Uh, I encouraged every student this morning to get online and get their application in. Um, because it, it gives them uh, an introduction, albeit a paid introduction, with a clearance uh, into our profession. And for 10 weeks, it's kind of a mutual interview. Uh, you can check us out, see if you like what you see on the inside, and, and vice versa. We end up offering uh, employment to 90% of our interns, and 90% of those accept. So the 10 weeks tend to go pretty well. Uh, but I also say, too, that because of the nature of the business, and I want to talk about this a little bit, is that while intelligence has always been a blend of art and science, and science and art, uh, the science component is growing these days. And I probably don't need to tell this room why, but, uh, but, the, but the ability of humans like myself in 1983 who, who, who peered through a microscope onto a plate of glass to look through a blue frame of imagery, I don't know why it was blue. To look into the Soviet Union uh, was something that humans could keep up with because our capacity to image the Soviet Union in the 1980s was pretty limited and very highly classified. And oh, by the way, the United States had a monopoly on that capability. So if you think of value propositions and what I bring to my customers in the 80s, I had something that no one else had an ability to look into the adversarial, to behind the enemy lines, to understand their capabilities, to, to, to create insight into their intentions in ways that no one could before. And by the way, this, this is a wonderful story of, the, of actually the American history. I just had about an hour to walk through President Johnson's permit exhibits and to see the growth of the space program. And then, let's face it, the reaction to Sputnik. Um, and the concern that that caused our country, and our country stepped up to this, uh, and our scientists stepped up to this challenge. So, but I contrast that time period when which we really had a monopoly. We had a monopoly on the ability to image this planet from space. And now fast forward 35 years, and the monopoly uh, has long been over. Uh, I call it a commercialization or a democratization of the way that we sense the planet. And you all on your phones now, if you'd like, uh, can access uh, commercial imagery of the planet at pretty much any place you'd like. Um, you can download different resolutions or quality of that image. You could, you could subscribe to updates if you wanted to revisit a part of, of the globe. And so in such a world, uh, I told you already the number of people that this country invests in our profession. There's a corresponding budget that's rather large. I'm not at liberty to say what it is. Uh, the DNI announces what the total is every year after that budget comes out. I think it was $64 billion, uh, last year. 
That's the total sum that the United States spent on its intelligence community last year. You can imagine that some part of that pie comes to NGA. So it's a lot of money. And you can imagine that, that the value proposition that I talked about in those old days is quite different now. Because I don't have something that no one else has. Now I do have capabilities, and we're quite proud of them, because you remember those scientists in the 50s and 60s that delivered our first access to space? Well, they're still there, and this country is still very well served by advanced research lab laboratories like the one that's here at the University of Texas, spread across this country to complete, to, to, to advance, uh, I'll call it exquisite capability from space. That's the, that's the, that's the piece of our cap capacity which we need to create insight into potential threats to our country. And we can talk more specifically about threats if you'd like, but I mean, you know, the, the headlines of North Korea, Iran, Russia, and China are at the forefront of our, of our mission and our objective. But I, but I lay out those two time periods for you to think about the transition, and in some ways this is a transition that the intelligence community has gone through. Because even though my experience has been specialized in this imagery world, what we now call geospatial intelligence, you could extend the conversation to NSA and the CIA and to the Defense Intelligence Agency. Because you can imagine a value proposition that existed in the, in, in, in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s that's quite different than the one today. I'll speak about my experience delivering that value proposition to the person we call customer number one for the four years that I was there. But I just wanted to set out that arc of of we, we had almost total control, almost monopolistic control over sensing and information, and that has dissipated. And just to remind, I have a strong view that the reason this country invests in an intelligence community is to create the opportunity for better decisions. It doesn't dictate the decisions, it doesn't, it doesn't make those decisions, but it creates the opportunity through insight, confidence, understanding, or warning, the left and right bounds of fill in the blank, Secretary of State, uh, President, uh, military uniformed <coughs> officer. Make better decisions to protect our forces, to secure our interests, to support our allies, etc. Well, the only, well, one way to make better decisions is to have an advantage over those who's on the other side of that decision. So if it's a negotiating table, you want to provide the Secretary of State with insight, understanding that enables his negotiations or her negotiations vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, an adversary. Likewise, and so when you think of the strategic arm limitation talks uh, and treaties, uh, likewise, when we send U.S. military forces into harm's way, we seek to do it in a way that they have advantage. They have additional confidence, understanding, insight into their precise location, knowing exactly where they are, having additional insight into where the threat is and what that threat is, and to be able to correlate the two so that whether their job is to navigate or to target or to deploy or to maneuver, they do it as safely as possible. Those are all better decisions. So I lay that out as a big arc. Um, the agency that I'm privileged to lead is thus going through a massive transformation. And that I know that word is, is a bit overused, but it's true in the sense that, remember when I said, you know, you had young Cardillo staring through a microscope, looking into a plate of glass and trying to peer into the the depths and the darkness of the Soviet Union, we now, not, now we don't have a scarcity of data, we have an abundance of data. And we will not keep up with that data by hiring more and more of me to do what I did. What we will do, what we must do, is create, whether it's machine learning, computer vision, augmented intelligence uh, uh, algorithms, to advance our understanding, to lift that analyst. By the way, I didn't replace the analyst, I just lifted the analyst so that they can see farther, understand better, create more insight. Um, we can come back to it later. I have, a, I have an issue with a term that for, over which I have no control, so it's something I just have to get used to, but this thing called artificial intelligence. 
And I'll just offer you this for now. We can talk more about it in Q&A. Um, I'll step back into the Oval Office. Mr. President, we have increased understanding in the Iranian nuclear program. The reason we have an increased understanding is I just got this signals intelligence report. It says thus. We have a source that we've talked to you about before in the Iranian government, and he reported thus. Cardillo and NGA just delivered a bunch of new pictures that showed this development, construction, advanced techniques, etc. And he reported thus. Oh, and here's some artificial intelligence. What part of what you just handed me is fake? When you say artificial, now, this is a learned audience. I think you know uh, where the term come from and why it's used. But I have to tell you, and I think this could be a place for our conversation later, in a world in which there's less and less agreement about what's true, this is a real issue. Because my, the prerequisite for me getting in that Oval Office was credibility. And look, we can also talk about the intelligence community's credibility over time. Where we got, got it right and where we didn't get it right. But the reason we get back in the room is because the president or the consumer values our view and trusts that we're doing our job correctly and we're proceeding you know, with a, uh, with a professional uh, uh, tradecraft uh, and approach. And so I'm just a little concerned okay, about the term uh, just because of the nature of our, of, you know, kind of our societal discourse right now. Uh, so anyway, I'll pause that for a minute. Uh, we can come back to it. So back to the Oval. Um, um, in uh, August 6th of 2010, uh, James Clapper was sworn in as the Director of National Intelligence. I had recently become the Deputy Director of the Defense Intelligence Agency. That was the agency that hired me out of college. That was my dream job. As a, as a civilian, it's the highest job you could obtain within the Defense Intelligence Agency. So here I'm thinking, I've made it. I mean, this, and I, I had like two weeks under my belt, and I, I couldn't wait to, uh, to execute in, in, uh, that job. And uh, Director Clapper called me, and he said, I, I'd like you to come out uh, and be my number three at the Director of National Intelligence. And, and I know you, well, you might have seen Director Clapper on TV. I don't know if he's been here before. Well, he was here for the, I know, for the PDB opening. Uh, he's a very difficult man to say no to. Um, but I did. And I said what I just said. I said, sir, I've just made my dream job, and I just had two weeks in it, and I really would like to do this job. And so two weeks went by, and he didn't call me the next time he called my boss, uh, General Burgess, and they struck a deal. And they said, uh, and so you always, you should get nervous, by the way, this is a, a tip I have for you tonight. When your boss shows up in your office, it's probably not a good reason. <laughs> so General Burgess came back and told me I was going out to the DNI. So, so in September of 2010, I go out to the DNI. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a second position there, it's called the Principal Deputy DNI. That person had not yet been nominated, not yet confirmed, so I was in that as the acting. And I learned about the inner workings of the President's Daily Brief on the fly. Now again, I had 28 years-ish under my belt as an intelligence professional, but let me tell you, moving into the PDB arena is quite a leap. And um, let me use the clock to tell you what life was like. So around 6 p.m. every night, save Saturday, because at least for the past number of years, we've done the PDB six days a week. So it's Monday through Saturday. So every night before one of those days, uh, a set, <coughs> I did a stack like this, it's not that big, um, a, a number of articles and, and briefings and papers are submitted for my final edit and review and approval to go to the president the next morning. And, and on a normal night, there would be six or seven drafts. Now, I say drafts just because they're drafts to me, but trust me, you can imagine how many reviews and edits and quality control checks it went through before it got on my desk. But I had, I had two things to do, first of all. One was to, to, to create the threshold question. So here's the draft. I've read it. Does the president need to see this? 
seems like a pretty straightforward question, but, but again, he's a busy man. Uh, there's many things crossing his mind. Uh, there's many issues already on his desk. Do I want to put this issue on his desk tomorrow morning? And, and that was the second question. If I decide he, he, he should see this, does he need it now? What is it about tomorrow that he needs to see this now? So once we make those decisions, you're down to, let's say, four or five uh, drafts. And then the rest of the evening is making edits and, and asking questions to the authors who are waiting for your review and tightening, et, et, et cetera. And it's interesting, I just it was upstairs looking at the PDBs that have been released uh, from President Johnson, and I couldn't help myself. I mean, I know they're 50 years old now, but I still wanted to edit them, because I thought, <laughs> I thought the language was way too loose. I said, why are we saying could? Good gracious, anything could happen. Uh, <laughs> so, that was generally my life from 6 to 9 p.m. on a good night, 6 to 10 on a bad night, 6 to 11 on a really bad night. Pretty much had to shut down by midnight in order to make the timelines put up. <coughs> President Obama uh, wanted his PDB and his residence around 6 a.m. Uh, he, and, and by the way, I didn't say already, the most important letter in PDB is P. So it's however and whenever the president wants it, and that's how it goes. And so that's what, so he wanted the, the, the brief to read by himself, and so he did. Uh, we would see him at 9.30 uh, in the morning uh, for half an hour. And at least, again, every president's different the way this president wanted. He, unless he had a question on the articles that he had read in the residence before he saw us, he expected us to take those articles and tell him the next story. So I got it what you told me about the Iranian nuclear program, or I understand the changes in the stability in this or that country, or I, I see the implications of this financial issue uh, over here. And so what? What's next? And so we called them walk-on briefs. Uh, they were very dynamically prepared. We tended to build them between 7 a.m and 9.25, 9.29 sometimes, um, to get ready. And, uh, and, and again, it was live theater. And so, and uh, President Obama, who again, I had the privilege of working for four years, um, yeah, I think this is fair to say. And this isn't, I'm not saying this because he was the president, but he was the most difficult human I've ever briefed because uh, poker face is not strong enough. Uh, just stone. Um, he, he would just stare. He was intently listening. And usually his finger would go into his temple like this as he was listening, but would not give you any tells. I mean, and in the life of a briefer, you live, remember I told you about credibility and seeing in the room. The next thing is, is, is you have to survive that exchange, and so body language is key. Please, a head nod, a scowl, something. <laughs> give me a hint. Right, that, that it's working, right? Because you want to either go further or if they're bored, you know, you want to move on. President Obama was a very difficult uh, person to breathe. Now, I, again, I, I say that with admiration. That was just his style. He was an ingester, and he would just ingest. When you said done, or when he knew you were done briefing, game on. He was not an interrupter, but then he, he, would, he would ask uh, the question you least wanted. <laughs> Because he would find the weakness, or he would, or he would connect the story in a different way and ask, okay, so what are we doing about this or that? Some of those things came back to me because they were intelligence questions with respect to further understanding. Many of them were to the rest of the room. You know, National Security Advisor, Mr. Brennan was in the room for most of those uh, briefings, Mr. McDonough, etc. About what are we going to do about this? Um, and then. Um, <coughs> So that briefing would go, um, you know, as I said, no more than 30 minutes, sometimes less. Uh, then I would go do a very small brief out. Um, uh, you can imagine that the, the number of people have access to PDB is pretty small. I know there was a recent story about President Trump's uh, distribution of it. Um, um, that's purposeful for a reason. Uh, and the people that you report you know, what occurred is also very carefully protected for a number of reasons. The main one being um, the privacy of the president. You know, it's, it's a working group meeting for him. He's with his personal staff. Um, it's not for me to go to report to anyone, quite frankly, uh, anything beyond, oh, we need to develop more collection on this issue. 
Uh, we confused him with this topic. Uh, he's got much more interest in this area. Those are the kinds of things that we would brief out. And then the cycle would, uh, would, would begin uh, again. Uh, I tell you that just to give you some insight into what that life is like. Um, uh, you can ask me about the current president uh, when we sit down. Um, I can't tell you uh, much of, because I'm not in that job anymore. Uh, I've had one opportunity to brief him. It was basically uh, an introduction to my profession and the craft that we provide him. And so it was more of a tutorial and educational piece. Uh, so uh, I, have, I have 300 plus data sets over here. I have one over here. I'm not the right guy to do a compare and contrast um, uh, on, these two, on these two men. Um, so now back to this, uh, the agency, and then I'll, I'll wrap and look for your, for your questions. Uh, I told you about the vast transformation, right, from monopoly uh, to uh, open. Uh, what we're seeking to do now is literally to create advantage, the outcome that we, that, the reason that we exist, but to do it in a way in which it's a much crowded world, it's a much more chaotic world. Um, I, we talked, or, uh, I spoke earlier about the issue of artificial and fake, etc. Um, I'm not immune from that. Um, those good old days where, you know, the U.S. government took this photograph, right? It was held within U.S. government channels. It was secured with a U.S. government security system. I'm handing it to you. Remember that credibility piece? You know exactly where that came from. Uh, I don't need to tell this audience that, that anything <coughs> that is digital is manipulable. And so we have to think much harder now about pedigree and, in a different sense, chain of evidence so that I can sustain that credibility or if I have doubt about the digits that I'm using or looking at or whatnot, that that doubt is part of the presentation. Uh, our human officers have lived with this forever. <coughs> Because you've got strong sources and you've got moderate sources and you've got sources that, boy, we are really just in the experimental stage here. Um, geospatial intelligence is having to learn how to deal with that because those good old days of I know exactly where these digits came from uh, is quite different. The other piece, though, that I, you know, I'd like to throw out to you, at least for your, your thought, if not your questions later, is that... The way the world is connected is different. I know that sounds simplistic and obvious, but what I mean by that is that you know we, we moved from analog to digital um, uh, en masse, uh, and, and the way the world communicates now is quite different. Uh, I would offer that for whatever lessons there are learned, and there are good ones and there are not so good ones that we've gone through in that transition, I think we're in the midst of a similar thing in the way the world is now sensed way that you're imaged, the way that we image the planet. And I think like in all things in life and like all technologies, there can be an upside and a goodness to it. And there can be a dark side. And uh, I appreciate that, that you might want to talk about you know, those bounds and uh, the issue between you know, you know, what's, what's privacy, what's security, where in, the, where in did the two meet. And so my profession, uh, the craft uh, that I lead for the U.S. government, uh, is trying to make inroads, and we have, and connections in much different ways uh, than we ever did before. As I said, in the old days, it was mostly government, a few large prime contractors uh, that, would, that would be hired to do some very large efforts. Uh, today, part of the reason for my trip to Austin, besides having this opportunity, is to connect with your tech sector. Uh, and I do it in New York, in Boston, and Silicon Valley, and I do it for the following reason. Um, the most significant advances in my profession, the craft, are going to happen in the private sector and not in the government sector. You could argue that's already happening, if it isn't already past tense. So that reality to me means that I've got to change the way that I engage with that sector. And by the way, I appreciate that some parts of those sector one, <coughs> may not know of my existence. Two, if informed of my existence, may not be interested. 
right? I mean, this is getting back to the issue of you know the, 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 the compact that we have as a society uh, with intelligence, security, and privacy. But I believe I would not be doing my job if I wasn't making at least those entrees and those openings to those sectors because whether it's the driverless car or the, uh, the, the lift at, after next, the geospatial advance that, that's going to occur publicly in, 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 well, within private entities for public consumption, I'm going to have to figure out how to interact with it. <coughs> and how to leverage to provide my responsibility on national security. Um, I'll finish with this. Uh, you know, we're very proud of, of, of our history support. We're quite optimistic about what we think we can offer uh, as a value proposition going forward. Uh, but we're also quite proud of what we do uh, on the humanitarian front. And uh, whether it's an earthquake in Nepal or fighting the Ebola uh, epidemic in West Africa, we're recovering from floods in the United States. And let me quickly say that I can only use my assets in the United States if a lead federal agency tasks me to do so. So I cannot apply my capabilities against the United States unless FEMA, Department of Homeland Security, etc., requests it. And last Sunday evening, uh, and everything around that national security event called the Super Bowl, we were involved in helping local, state uh, authorities provide situational awareness and security around that. So, so we're proud of, again, the traditional foreign support that we've done, but we're also quite proud of what we're able to do domestically. Um, I should add, we are more and more on the World Wide Web. If you go to nga.mil, uh, you'll see a lot of the work that we've done on the Arctic. We have posted all of that for scientific research. Um, but never before, uh, uh, at resolutions that have never been for, before been provided, and again, uh, that's part of the contribution that we want to give back, um, again, given the great investment that the, the taxpayers made. Uh, with that, I'll thank you for allowing me to come to see, uh, speak with you today. I'm going to move to one of these chairs over here and invite Steve up to, the, to continue the conversation. Thank you very much. Pleasant outside. I've already apologized on behalf of the Chamber of Commerce to uh, <laughs> Dr. Cardillo for the, for the crummy weather. Thanks very much for coming down. We really appreciate it. Uh, you all should know that, that you might have only been able to make it out to this particular event, but Director Cardillo has been extremely busy and helpful all day. He's been in with some classrooms and talked to students, monitored simulation. Give some advice to a group of PRP students who are working on a research project, year-long project here at the school. Uh, submitted to a research interview on behalf of one of our Plan Two students, so he, he's really uh, doing a lot for us, and we're very grateful. Thanks for coming down. Well, it's not completely selfless. We have we have 38 UT grads uh, on the team now, and we'd love it to be 48, 58, 68. Uh, so we want more. <laughs> All right, so that's the start of the pitch, which I expect will continue. Uh, so Robert, like, a, like the good intelligence officer he is, has anticipated most of my questions and, and answered them, or at least touched on them uh, in your remarks. So if you don't mind, I'd like to follow up on just a few of those areas, then I'll quickly turn it over to you all, so think about things you might want to ask uh, Director Cardillo. Let me take you back just to, to first principles. Uh, Geo, what the heck yeah. is geospatial intelligence? Uh, when's it useful to have? When's it less useful? How's it come together with the more, if dare say, celebrated uh, disciplines of intelligence, uh, human intelligence, signals intelligence? Help us understand a little bit about yeah. what, what is an arcane profession. So it's it's a bit of a mouthful, geospatial, and it can elicit what the heck is it? But I. Let me put it this way, humankind has been uh, employing geospatial information at least, we can see if it's intelligence or not, but since somebody decided that's my cave on the left, that's your cave on the right, okay, here's the line, 
in which we've dis agreed is <laughs> my property and yours. Uh, it's, it's locational services. Um, you know, I talked about it from a military construct, but I suspect many of you, when you get back into your conveyance vehicle this evening, or when you ask it to arrive or whatever, you'll use a locational service to get you to your next location. And, and why do you do it? Because you want to be efficient? You want to avoid bad things? Uh, look, Waze is even a better example now. Because what does Waze also tell you? Red light camera ahead. What is that other than a warning, right? That's, that's an intelligence warning. Now we can debate whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, but it's a warning. And, right, uh, the little cop car sitting up uh, on the right side of the road. Uh, all of that is geospatial information. Um, I'll steal a line from General Clapper, who by the way is the father of geospatial. He coined it and built it and branded it and grew it. Everything and everyone has to be somewhere. Right? It sounds silly and rather obvious, but it's true. And so to your point, think of it as a frame of, to understand our world. And think of that in a literal sense. It's mapped, it's charted, it's measured, the, the gravity field is understood, the elevation is known and all that. But also think of it as a mental frame. So the exquisite human contribution that you or your predecessors, uh, successors, I'm sorry, would, would create. Well. Without context, it's hard to understand that contribution. So where did it come from? Where's it going? What's his or her background? And so think of it as, we like to think of us, ourselves foundationally, that you can put things on top of it. But as the world now is becoming more accessible, again, we can talk about the good and bad. You know, everything's a sensor now. Uh, it's also a way to create some coherence out of what could be chaos. Thanks. You mentioned towards the close of your remarks uh, a little bit about your relationship with the private sector. Mm -hmm. So I just want to follow up on that a bit. You even allowed that uh, in some cases uh, folks running private businesses might not be enamored of Correct. working so closely with the U.S. government. We saw that, I think, in spades after the Snowden revelation. Indeed. Some of the some of the larger uh, IT firms decided that it wasn't good business right. to be seen too openly working with the U.S. government, certainly not the U.S. intelligence community. Has that been your experience? Uh, because because many of us who have spent careers in intelligence, and Admiral Inman can certainly amplify this, we're used to actually close and supportive, sure. even patriotic, sure. very relationships with the private sector. So, sure. Which, what's been your experience? Uh, it has not been negative, but I guess it's hard to prove that it's, you know, not negative. So, uh, I mean, I can tell you that I've not had knockdowns or very tense interaction with certain companies over, oh, you know, we're going we're gonna to keep our distance. We used to be connected to you and we're breaking ties. I haven't had that kind of experience. But I can't tell you that I haven't had the opportunity to work with some companies who made that decision on their own, right, and said, look, we're for whatever our business value, our market place, our communication strategy, we don't want that NGA logo anywhere near us. Um, and, 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 and again, I, you know, I, not a complete accident to finish, you know, on our humanitarian side. Um, because I, I guess, I do want people to know and to understand, and by the way, this is, you know, universities, think tanks, companies, and, and foreign partners. I have, you know, many, many foreign partners. Um, I mentioned the Arctic. We're now doing the Antarctic. Um, but by the way, any airline landing or taking off or landing is doing so with NGA support. Um, that's across the globe. Any, any U.S. military vessel going from port to port is doing it with NGA support. So that's our safety of navigation mission, which we're proud to contribute. Um, by the way, the reason that your Waze app works is because of the global positioning system, which at one time was a very highly classified U.S. military capability to do military kinds of things. So. I guess, Steve, I, I do appreciate that this, and, and by the way, I, 
I'm a big believer that dialogue's healthy. So uh, I think we can have a healthy dialogue here. And I certainly will respect companies that say, look, you know, this is the kind of business we're going after, or this is kind of the kind of view we're trying to build, and, and we don't see you in, in that. And, you know, to me, that's no harm. I, I guess I'll continue to compete in, in a constructive way because my responsibility hasn't changed. It's legislative. Uh, I mentioned safety navigation. I have a force protection mission. I have an intelligence mission. And I'll do everything within my wherewithal and the law <coughs> to execute that. Um, but I, I think the debate is broadly healthy uh, on this regard right now. I, I do think it's going to get. I do think it's going to get more complicated, though. Um, We've only seen the beginning of unmanned aerial vehicles. Right? They will become more prevalent. And I don't know where and how that's going to go. By the way, that's not my job. I don't manage them. I don't control them. But let's face it, I think that's going to add to the way the world is sensed. And I think we're going to have more conversations, both as citizens to one another, about what is privacy anymore and, and who can go and fly where and sense what. But, uh, but again, I'm a big believer that if we can have a healthy dialogue, we can get to a better place. Can I just follow up quickly on that because I was curious to hear you say that. What is the what is the division of labor? What's the rationale behind it? Because you were very much in the business at NGA of interpreting images and data from <coughs> overhead collection sources. So if the UAV mission belongs somewhere else and, and you're taking product from satellite and fixed yeah. aircraft, where, where are we dividing this into? No, this? I'm glad you re-asked because then I missed it. <coughs> I have every responsibility to exploit drone or unmanned area vehicle. Doesn't I'm agnostic as to where what altitude something is. Okay. Um, I, I, all I was saying is I don't own those decisions about where drones can fly and if you have to license them and can they be within 300 feet of this or that. Uh, I'll just give you a little insight. I can't go into great detail, but on the broader issue of where do I put analytic horsepower. The largest single segment is against that is, is against that airborne account. So in the old days, like when I was hired, it was almost all from space. We now put more against air than we do against space. Interesting. You mentioned some of the <coughs> non-military applications of the, of the service you provide to uh, the American public, to, to world public. Ask you to catch me up a little bit on a debate that I left about 10 years ago, not too long after the establishment of the Department of Homeland Security, mm -hmm. the beginning of the reorganization of the U.S. intelligence community, and the government at that time, Bush administration, proposed what seemed to many of us like a, a fairly sensible um, rearrangement of responsibilities for when you could use our spy satellites here in the United States, mm -hmm. right, for common, common good. Well, that, that kicked up quite a storm. Uh, certain factions in the Congress, it was posited as a civil liberties and privacy issue. Um, and then ultimately, the incoming Obama administration retracted the, the proposal. So today, you mentioned the Super Bowl. You mentioned support to natural disaster, natural disaster relief, uh, forest fires. Some of these other things are on your, on your website. Who makes decisions yeah. about when you can use your exquisite capabilities in our country and, and <coughs> have constraints on that? Who's interested in my civil liberties in that conversation? So it's a very deliberate process. Um, so um, a hurricane is approaching the Gulf Coast. Uh, we would have to get a request. And it's, it's, the term of art is a lead federal agency. So a lead federal agency would have to fill out what's called a proper use memorandum and say that uh, I request that uh, NGA uh, provide me with imagery coverage in this area in this time frame for the following reasons, uh, rescue, resupply, reconstruction, et cetera. So that's all in the proper use. It goes from the lawyer, the general counsel of that agency, to my general counsel. And so it's reviewed by them when they believe we think we're within the bounds of the policy. We double check it. Um, um, I'm sure my bosses double check it out at the Office of Director of National Intelligence. 
But I have to tell you, Steve, it's uh, one, we take it seriously, so this is not, we don't take shortcuts here. But I've been the director for almost three and a half years, and it has not hit my, you know, I've, I've got problems in my desk, and I've got things that are working pretty well. It's in the things that are working pretty well pile. You know what I mean? It's not something, I think we have found a good rhythm here, and I think there's a good deliberate process for that review now. And not to bore too deeply into, into specifics, but you describe sort of broad area problems, and one can see how mm -hmm. uh, the image from space or the image from overhead would be extremely useful fighting forest fire or <coughs> tracing flood damage. But has it ever come down to uh, fresh dirt in the backyard of somebody's home? Uh, <laughs> law, law enforcement matters? <coughs> not under my watch. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm unaware that we've got or be, even been asked that kind of detail. Okay. Interesting. So uh, what I'm relieved to hear is that it no longer involves the U.S. Geological Society and the civil applications process and the Department of Interior, I, I, if I understand correctly. Yeah, I think that's who owned it at the time. If that was old, then yes, that was the, it's different now. Okay. Terrific. So you mentioned your service at the, at the Office of Director of National Intelligence. Frankly, you occupied a series of really important leadership positions virtually since the early 2000s when the landmark intelligence mm -hmm. reform bill was passed. So you've, you've seen post-9-11 intelligence reform from lots of perspectives. Um, I'd be curious in your, yeah. in your judgment on, yeah. you know, is it working? And then how should we understand that the Director of National Intelligence today, is it as the law required or compelled a unifier, yeah. a greater unit unit of is an integrator, yeah. is an overseer, uh, so, or layer manager. Are, are we better off? Um, have we learned the lessons? You know, it's a huge question. Uh, my top line answer is yes, we are better off. We are more integrated. We have learned and applied most of the lessons. Uh, let me just give you one example. I'm going to have to be a little cryptic uh, because the topic remains. Well, it's certainly public news, you'll know here sort of shortly, but I can't go into detail as to why I'm saying some things which might be frustrating. But, but look, in the summer of 2013, I was in, in my position uh, at the DNI, uh, and we got indications from social media, first, uh, Facebook and U YouTube, as I recall, were the primary sources of some sort of Catastrophic, catastrophic event in the suburbs of Damascus. And it began an intelligence assessment as to whether or not, at the broadest level, weapons of mass destruction were employed by the Assad regime against the opposition. Remember my responsibility. That night, I was editing the first PDB article on what did we know, what didn't we know, what did we assess. And again, I'm sorry, you're just going to have to trust me <coughs> because it'll be 32 years before I can prove this. <laughs> but I, I, I'm just telling you that the article, that what we put in front of President Obama that next morning was very, very good. It was not confirmed, it was not, we know this happened, but I, I just have to tell you that we, that integrative analytic story that was, that was threads that night, okay, just early indications came together in a way that over the next few weeks developed into a stronger and stronger case. And I'll, and, and to remind, you know, the president was on the cusp of making a decision about employing U.S. force in reaction to this assessment. And you all, I mean, I can remember it viscerally because I was in the center of it. This was another great moment. This was another great, and I mean great as in big, not great as in great, for the U.S. intelligence community because here we are, WMDs employed, used with X confidence, you know, and Y results. It's on the president's desk. He's going to take this and either take an action or not. And as you recall, the president decided to take the discussion, debate, to the Hill. 
And so we moved it to the Capitol Hill, and I became the intelligence briefer for Congress. Um, and so I went up with my colleagues from the Joint Staff and the White House and the State Department, and, and, and I was the lead briefer. And, and I recall, you know, with, especially on the House of Representatives side, rooms with this many people <coughs> and more. And, and you could feel the tension the magnitude of the decision they were being asked to make. Do we go to war? Right? Do we employ U.S. force over this? And I had the privilege, and I mean that, of making the case. Not the case to go to war. That's the policy choice. But the case behind the assessment. And I won't tell you we convinced every member of Congress, because again, it was still an intelligence system. But it was, I, I feel very proud of what we did in those days. Uh, I don't, we did not over it, oversell it, we did not undersell it. It was professionally constructed, it was well crafted, it was well uh, sourced, etc. I know I just gave you one case study for which you can't check my homework on it, so I know this could be a little bit frustrating. But to me, Steve, I think it is exemplary of how the community is better integrated now. And we do challenge each other in ways that we didn't before. And we all do compete in a constructive way to try to get the best assessment in front of our leadership. So one example of where I think it is better, still not good enough, um, and we have learned most of the lessons. Maybe it never will be. Right. Certainly won't be perfect. Thanks very much, Mr. Director. I'm ready for questions. Who's got one? Sir, you first. Stephen Polanski, Texas A&M. Thank you for being here. Yes, you mentioned GPS. Yes. Given the increasing vulnerabilities and the end of global reliance on America's system, what do you see as the future of GPS? <laughs> so I, remember I told you about my desk? This is on the I worry about it side. Um, you know, I think it's analogous to my comment. Remember, we, uh, space was a benign environment in my good old days. We owned it. We operated it. We knew it. We, we had great confidence. Um, there was a similar period for GPS. Right? Um, and let's face it, space is not a benign environment. Uh, it's a contested environment. Um, uh, you know, state actors are employing you know, threats and threats of threats. So, and by the way, NGA is quite proud of our role to make GPS as good as it is. I don't, I don't run it or manage it, but I have really smart mathematicians that make sure that you guys make the right turn at the right place uh, on your app. Uh, so we, we're, we're there more for calibration and accuracy, uh, and we're proud of that piece of it. Um, I get, look, I, I know that the United States Air Force has got this question in the center of their desk, right? Because uh, in, in, if that space is contested, we need to create resiliency in, in our capability. And one, it's very hard to talk about anywhere because it's very complicated all the different layers and places that you need to be more resilient because let's face it right weakest link creates the vulnerability <laughs> so there's a lot of time and energy and thought process going in into your question um, uh, again i part of my trip today i was at your uh i'm not yours but the ut's uark uh, university affiliated research center uh, out here and part of their work is to help me on the GPS mission. And um, they too are helping on understanding, uh, by the way, it's not just GPS now. I know you know that, but there's Chinese systems and Russian systems and European systems and Japanese systems. And to me, um, that can be part of the answer and should be part of the answer that while the US should have its proud component of it, we need to acknowledge, be aware of, understand, and where appropriate, integrate other capabilities as well. Um, I'm well aware that once you integrate something else, it, it, it's an opportunity and a risk, right? It's both at the same time. You don't control it, you don't own it. Uh, if you get dependent upon it, it goes away. Um, I guess this is a long way to Stephen, right? 
it's a long way to say, Stephen, it's, it's something that we, I, again, not on, just on my desk, but we collectively think about a lot. And, and, and look, at, I, I'm one of the biggest fans. Of, by the way, SpaceX had another success today, the first heavy launch. Uh, yes, uh, 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 there's a company called Rocket Labs that's going to start launching. You know, they had one successful launch out of New Zealand. Access to space is, is a good thing, and I'm not saying this is director of NGA. I think it's a good thing for commerce. I think it's a good thing for science. I think it's a good thing for education. And so I think it's in all of our interests, not just in our defense or national security interests, that's, that space be secure. Um, now, you know, there's lots of debates about space policy and space behavior and all that, and that's, that's not the um, and, um, but, but I guess, I guess what I'm trying to say is that I, I think the more assured that we can be of not equal but open access to space, I, I think it's better for all of us, because at the end of the day, I want I think a confident system is a more stable system, and when there's when there's a lack of that stability, I think that breeds a corresponding lack of confidence. Misunderstanding leads to mis uh, misread of actions. Unintended events happen. So I know I didn't get exactly at your question, Stephen. Uh, it's really hard, other than to agree that it's it's a very big issue and we're working on it. Thank you, students. Um, in the discussion about privacy and security, um, I'm interested in sort of your assessment on the cyber vulnerabilities of your agency and how, yeah. uh, how once intelligence has been collected, how you keep it secure throughout the chain yeah. as one of the major things in your yeah. pile of things to worry about. It's, it's on the worry side, and you know, I try to at least speak to that at the high level. You know, good old days, complete control, ownership. Lots of walls, classification, lock bags, really, really nice and tight. You just described every time I meet a new company, right? And say, oh, wow, that's a great product or service or whatnot or application. And I plug in, goodness comes and risk comes. And so uh, I have to be much better at cyber hygiene. Um, I have to spend more time and money and energy and expertise on protection. Uh, you, you should expect no less, uh, given my responsibilities. Um, I talked earlier about our safety of navigation provision. Most of that is done on the internet. You know, we, you have to communicate to an aircraft. You want to make sure you can get them an updated landing approach or navigation aid or whatnot. You're going to be out there. And so we are immensely and intricately involved in cybersecurity, and it's a growing investment of mine over time. Again, I'm not, I'm not responsible for cybersecurity per se. Uh, I have friends and colleagues around the government who do that and are expert. Um, but you're exactly right. We have to invest more to do, I'll say simple protection. It's not that simple, but to protect our mission as much as we used to be able to do just to advance it. So it's a, it's a big issue. Uh, Fernando Rios, uh, how do you feel the uh, abundance of data and will affect the relationship between producers and consumers of intelligence if it has to be Yeah, so if you didn't hear the question, is it Fernando? Yeah. Yeah, the question is, uh, how do you deal with the abundance of data and the fact that customers may have as much, if not more, than I have? over on that side of the desk because, uh, well, for two reasons. One, just as I have a responsibility to understand what data I have, the value of it, the pedigree of it, the veracity of it, the, the cyber cleanliness of it, when I interact with you and you've got data sets on your side and, and I don't know what you have, that just compounds my problem because you may already have been invested in a certain data set. It might lead you to a certain conclusion or understanding. Well, I haven't done the due diligence yet. I, what I think I should owe you is some ability to say, you know what, Fernando, 
I get it that you believe the following is going to occur or has occurred because of this data, but uh, I think there's some you know, weak points or frailties in the data or there's some risk uh, associated. So if that's the case, my workload just got bigger, right? Not only am I worried about the data that I'm bringing to your desk, I'm worried about the data that's not worried. I'm concerned about the data that's on your desk. Um, I'll be real honest with you, though. I don't, I don't do a lot of that today because I'm kind of busy with the data I got. You know what I mean? And every day I turn around and there's not the same amount of data, there's more coming in. Uh, but you bring up a good point. I think I'm going to have to get better at not just cleaning up and, and securing and protecting the data sets that I'm the steward for, but, but offering the same service to you. So it's probably going to be a, I see it as an application that would, that would be the interface between you and me. Um, just as you want to make sure that the data I'm bringing has got the right veracity or confidence or quality, I should give you a tool or an ability to be able to test yours as well. Um, but I want to be clear, that's, that's work to be done. I don't, have a, I don't have a lot of capacity to do that now. Thank you. Mr. Director, can I drop back just one second and ask you one that I, I probably Only if I call me Robert. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, I think you hinted at an answer earlier, but pulling the camera back a little bit, you used the arc of your career to describe sort of the pace of technology yeah. and, you know, we all understand that runaway acceleration of digital change. Where do you come down on that on the net question? So you're speaking on behalf of, of U.S. intelligence. Is this a net hazard for, for the intelligence business, uh, a net risk, or on balance, is this a net opportunity and an advantage, particularly for the U.S. intelligence community? So I'm, I come down pretty strong here. I, I don't think it's even close. I think it's hugely positive. I come from the belief that transparency tilts towards goodness. It's just harder for darkness to occur. Okay, and so I know I'm getting a little metaphysical here, but you know, this is, you know, good and evil exist in our <laughs> Yeah, you got the more Right, but, but, but light is good. Okay, so I've talked about some of the risks of that light and some of the risks of being transparent in our lives and all that, but boy, I think it's way better than the world that's, <laughs> I don't know what's going on, or I have no insight. So, again, not without risk, Steve, but I, I'm a huge believer that this is, this is goodness. And, and I guess you, like many of us, have a good deal of confidence in the U.S. Uh, US society, the US private sector in particular, I, I, I think this is an area we can and will continue to compete strongly. Yeah, and if I could, uh, one of the things we're trying to propose to advance that exchange is, uh, we call it a public-private partnership. Um, if you're a US taxpayer in the room, you've invested a lot of money, okay, in my agency and in our history. And even though the agency is only 22 years old, we have decades of data, defense mapping agency, army map service, and whatnot. If you're a computer scientist in the room and you're looking to train a new algorithm on machine learning or computer vision, what do you want and need? Labeled data sets to train the algorithm to work the way that you want it to work. So what we're proposing, and we've been very public about it, that's the public part of this, is to compete the data sets that we have within our agency and to enable companies, schools, and think tanks that bring the best application, and I'm not the guy to judge those, but we should hire experts who judge those, and say, okay, yeah, you, you get this data set to advance your scientific study, your entrepreneurial idea, you can go sell more shoes or coffee or whatever. What I want back is that really cool algorithm that you developed, and I'm going to apply that for national security uh, uh, issues. That basic value exchange has been tentatively okayed by Congress, tentatively, okay. Um, they've allowed us to explore that this year, uh, which we're doing now. We haven't yet gotten to the exchange, but <coughs> to me though, that goes to how could we help one another. Um, um, but if, if you invite me back in a year or so, I should have news on it. <laughs> Done. We'll do that. 
try to reach into the back a little bit further. In the blue shirt, almost like, right. yes, you, thanks. Uh, Drew Danik, I'm a student here at UC. Uh, thank you for being here and thank you for your service. I was kind of wondering um, what you can legally tell us. Uh, any kind of failure of either your, you personally or your agency and how you learn from that? Um, I'm not hesitating because I can't. I'm just trying to think which one am I going to pick. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, can I say before I figure out which one I'm going to pick, um, that's the nature of the business. Okay, so, you know, I think we'd agree one of the best communicators about our business beyond Ed Malema is General Hayden. He's a wonderful explainer of what we do. And if we're not getting stuff wrong, we're not trying hard enough. You know, I mean, it's the whole, we don't do the easy stuff. We do the hard stuff. Um, um, yeah, I'll go with this one. Um, I told you when I got the job at the White House, September of 2010. In December, riots began, mainly based on food supply or lack thereof in Tunisia. Uh, the man that was in charge of Tunisia, his name was Ben Ali. He had been there for 20, 30 years, uh, long-term autocratic dictatorial rule. Um, we conveyed at the highest levels that those riots were episodic, they happened every few years, that Ben Ali knew how to deal with them, put them down, wasn't the way that we would, but it won't go anywhere. <laughs> or whatever you want to call it, and we did not serve the president well. Now, I happened to be there at the point of <laughs> delivery, and so I felt it more particular than I would have otherwise. And, and, and I think we should not just learn that lesson, but apply it. You know, look, look, our profession is hard. That doesn't excuse what I just told you, but you know, most, most of what happens tomorrow most of what will happen tomorrow is because of what happened today. Right? I mean, that's, that's just kind of how life runs. Things tend to go along a certain way. Doesn't matter. Our job is to detect, to warn, to create insight when tomorrow will not be like today. So that's, that's a general one. Um, I guess closer to NGA, um, well, look, I'll just tell you one that I'm not pleased with now. And I'm going to be generic about it because it gets in a sensitive area. area. But um, under, under, under our collective watch, North Korea has developed uh, a, a growing capability to hold this continent at risk. And it's done it over a number of years, and you all have seen it in the papers of late as, it, as that has accelerated. Launches, distances, ranges, etc. Um, me telling a customer it went 600 miles, or 800 miles, or 1,000 miles is interesting and necessary at one level, and completely insufficient at another level. I'm making this personal now. It, it's a U.S. intelligence community. It's an international issue. Okay, this is we have allies in South Korea and Japan, of course, who are uh, connected to this. But the, I guess I guess what I'm saying is the fact that I can't bring more options. And please don't take this as that, that I just said. You know, different war options. I just mean options from understanding, right? That that, that there's so much we don't know. That we should know uh, about this. Even you know, I saw Director Pompeo the other day talking about this issues and saying, "Yeah, we we are we are we are not on our best game. We we have got to do better here." So, 
I wouldn't call that a failure yet because you know we're still trying to deepen our understanding. But I, I'll tell you that's an area in which I feel a lot of responsibility for that we we just have to be better. Um, you know, and, and and that's a comment better for the country that I work for, but I I think it's a it's a broader global better that we need to be. Clearly, an example of this I was asking about earlier, where geowind is, is uniquely uh, at the center of the yeah. end of the problem. Not unique, unique, but more. We're more dependent there than other places, just because of the nature of that hard target. Absolutely. Oh, the oh my goodness. Could we be time up now? <laughs> Actually, throw the towel. We're forgiven for the audience. It isn't a question, it's a story. For you. You guys are in for a treat. <laughs> and this is about why they were able to hire you in 1981. <laughs> but to set across the difference in presidencies and time and structure. Yeah. I took over as the deputy director on 13 February. The director went to New Zealand on a fishing trip. Two weeks later, I got a call. The president wants to see you. No details of what it was. And quickly down, I get to the White House, and Frank Carlucci, my predecessor, now the Deputy Secretary of Defense, is there. We're ushered in, a little politeness, and then he turns to me and said, Bill Casey tells me you're going to be doing the budgets and the resources. I want you to rebuild the intelligence community, anything you need. And Frank, you find where to put it in the defense budget. Thank you for coming. Wow. End of the conversation. We left. Four months putting together a detailed plan, cross it, how did you rebuild them? Tell the chief staff, I'm ready to report. Uh, Jim Baker said, he doesn't like a lot of detail. I understand that. We go in, Frank is there, and say, we've completed the plan. Uh, we're putting it in place. Frank says, you know, we're putting it in the budget. And the president said, did you get everything you want? And I said, well, there were constraints. We've drawn down the training establishment somewhat that there were pace at which we could rebuild. At which President Reagan said, well, you're going to take care of those, aren't you? We're going to work at it. Thank you. End of conversation. But that launched the building up. <coughs> For five years, right. and we go simple direction what he wanted, and then leaving all the details on how to do it. Well, thank I, you. I don't know how to thank you enough. <laughs> 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 Me too. Yeah. Yeah, sir. Perhaps to take you back to your days of peering through the yeah. lens at those blue films, uh, thinking of. Uh, Deception, right, and or camouflage even. Does do today's technologies make it harder to create deception? Uh, and as a result, yeah. is there a great deal more being expended on that? So I talked about what I think is the value of a transparent world. Um, so in that sense, yes, it is harder to hide. Now. Again, public-private issues we can discuss. <laughs> you know, it's but I guess from a nation-state perspective, it's it's much more difficult to hide these days. Well, it, it's much more difficult to hide the kinds of things that I was looking for in the 1980s, right? Large armies, large military buildups, kind of traditional equipment. It is has done nothing on the cyber side, right? Way easier uh, in, a, in many ways to hide that behavior. Uh, Counterproliferation has become much more difficult. Um, just think of the advent of 3D printing, right? Uh, you don't even have to ship the piece, the part, etc. What you need is the file, right? To digitally get to the component. So, um, so I, think it it, I think it just depends on the issue. I think, I think nation state wise it's harder to hide. I think, let's face it, as, as the rise of the individual threat, right, the, 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 the 
violent extremist threat, I think that's become, that's, that's become easier to hide uh, in some ways. Uh, hi, honest. Um, I had a question about um, earlier you were referring to how on social media you were able to gather some things that were happening around the world. <coughs> and um, there's a lot of data that's collected by, you know, on YouTube, on yep. Google, on Facebook. Do you think that there's any value in that type of somewhat more open? intelligence as opposed to, say, you know, the geospatial intelligence that yeah. may be gathered? And if so, how, how do you think that should be implemented if it's not? So it's, a, it's a big question. It's a very good one. Um, it's hard to succinctly respond to. Uh, so one, yes, there is value. Um, but you won't be surprised about the next statement. There's risk there, too. So. Um, you know, the, the crowd if you don't mind, uh, the crowd has information, the crowd has perspective, and to the extent that the crowd is posting that perspective is, is useful. Again, the first indicator that I had you know, as, as the President's briefer to a potential catastrophic use of WMD was social media. Um, let's face it, after we got over the uh, nothing's going to happen in Tunisia. A lot of the information about what was happening in that Arab Spring was being driven by, reported by, interacted by social media. So we would be negligent to say, oh my goodness, we don't know where that comes from and we don't know who that is, etc. Um, to not get in and, and figure out where the left and right bounds are. I think the challenge isn't you know, good or bad, I think the challenge is, is it exists, it will likely grow, the, the commentary of the crowd, the documentation of our observations of the planet as we move around it. I think my challenge is, is how do I, how do I interact with that data, how do I leverage that data, how do I condition the data in a way that's useful to all the missions that I have. And and again, I, I have every duty to, to, to respect and to protect your right of privacy as I do to, re, to, to, to your right of security. And, and, and I'm not trying to make a choice there. I'm just trying to say that I, that I think I can hold both of those things in my head. And by the way, I, I got a lawyer right here, right, and a lawyer right here. And so we've got a lot of help uh, when we're doing that. And so I don't. I don't know if you're worried about this, I don't, and I'm not telling you not to worry about it. I think it's something we should wrestle with, uh, to be sure. But I, I think one of the central points I was trying to make in this talk is that the era of government-only access to information is gone. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not only okay with that, I think that's a good thing. But I'm a government institution funded by government tax dollars with a, with, 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 with a legislated requirement to create government, positive government outcomes, safe navigation, uh, protection of, of U.S. forces, et cetera, and interest. But I have to leverage that reality in order to do that, that ultimate job. I guess my comment, I know we're wrapping up, is, is that please know that I'm doing it legally and ethically and morally uh, as I as I struggle to do you know to do both of those things so um, if this is wrap up I are we one, close I have one more for well you. then I'll wait but anyway but uh, uh, hopefully that begins to address what, what is a very large question so thank you as our time does draw to a close I want to make sure director Carnello gets the last word uh, on behalf of the students out there who might want to have the same kind of rewarding career you've had, uh, what, what, should, what should they learn? What should they know? How should they think about getting ready and, yeah. and navigating the labyrinth? So I mentioned this to the class this morning, but uh, I, to me there's three components to, 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 to this profession. Uh, the first one is uh, what I call insatiable curiosity. Uh, it's hard to 
not only not be successful, it's hard to even enjoy the job if you don't have that. If you don't just seek to understand how the world works and how humans interact and how, how issues unfold, it's going to be difficult. Um, two, uh, you do have to be able to um, hold two things to be true. One is, uh, is, is confidence in what you contribute to outcomes. So that's your experience, your education, your expertise. Your pride in that, your confidence in that is necessary, but it has to be counterbalanced and met by an equal humility of the limitations of what you know. And that the expert to your left or the person to your right or the, or the, or the, or the predecessor, you know, who has a different perspective has to be melded together. Those people that have that kind of self-awareness, self-confidence do very, very well. And then finally, um, even though I did get an enormous sum from DIA, uh, the raises haven't been so great. So um, you won't get rich in our business. Um, you'll live a fine life. You, you won't go hungry either. Um, but you really need to be willing to serve something greater than yourself. Um, uh, there, there's an outcome that's beyond us, and, and I'll finish with this. This profession is a privilege. It, it really is. Um, it's not always fun. Uh, it's, 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 it's an inordinate responsibility, but I consider it nothing but a privilege. And uh, Admiral, if you don't mind, since you're here, uh, we're just a link in the chain, and the baton gets passed, and thank you for your service and what, you, what you're continuing to do. Um, part of the reason I'm here is I'm looking for people to pass the baton to, and so um, uh, yes, that was directed more to the students, uh, uh, but uh, look, there's 850 openings at NGA, and the only way they're going to get filled is if you go to NGA.mil and you hit on that button. <laughs> I'd like to take a peek. So tell them Robert sent you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Looks, thanks for your time. Um, uh, uh, as I said at the beginning, I really enjoy these conversations. Um, uh, so thanks for the opportunity to do it. I hope we can continue it in some way. I'd be happy to uh, to come back at some time if it makes sense. Uh, but uh, uh, but the fact that you're engaging this in conversation is is critically important. I'm a big believer, as I said earlier, if we can if we can have that discourse, if we can if we can civilly agree and disagree, uh, we can advance our cause together. And so I think it's these kinds of interactions that further that that outcome. So for being a small part of that, and, and for bringing all members of the family. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Youngster wants the baton. Yes. <laughs> I appreciate your time. Thanks very much.